With no further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Doug Hoglin, our CTO at Trace Register. Thank you, Robert. Good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to uh, take a deeper dive into full chain traceability. Last week, we spoke about what full chain traceability is and kind of at the high level what it can deliver. To today, I want to peel back the curtain and discuss more about the nuts and bolts and how it works. So the first thing to keep in mind, it's all about the data. As we said yesterday, no, last week, it, this is truly a big data problem. I, we have high variety of data, high velocity data, and high volume of data. Now the good news is that big data can also give us big value. And as we showed last week, there are numerous different ways people are using full chain traceability data, in reducing costs, managing risk, and et cetera. This is a technical webinar, but last, there was a question that came up last week regarding what's the background on this. And over the last 15 years, Trace Register has been active participant in seafood traceability. Over the last four years, we've been working extremely hard on the brand new platform. And it is during this development, or what we call TR5, that we have created a brand new traceability platform, new applications, including you know, new web apps, new mobile apps. And it is based on this experience and it's our findings of and basing this webinars on. As I mentioned last time, a key finding was this seven pillars of full chain traceability. We had the product identifiers, we had the critical tracking events, which is how we captured actually the historical records. We have the standards, global dialogue on seafood traceability. We worked very hard with them, GS1. We have a concept called linked data, court blockchains, master data, and is called GS1 digital link. Now what we found also surprised us, but also gave some explanation for why many earlier efforts on creating a solution for full chain traceability fail. For instance, without blockchain, it's very difficult to ensure trust in a fully interoperable and open full chain traceability solution. Without linked data, it's nearly impossible to have a strong connection between the physical product and the digital product. Without globally unique product identifiers, it is very hard to track the identity of the trace product. To be clear, we did not develop any of these technologies. We simply identified a need and found existing technologies that solved the different problems and thereby identified the technology stack needed for full chain traceability. Looking at this, some may say, Doug, aren't you missing a key pillar? What happened to document management? My answer is based on our experience, it's a strong no. Document and certificates are an integral part of full chain traceability. I will address this and show these example of this several times during the following slides. So let's, what are, our goals here. So given a product identifier, I want to know something about it. So what do I mean by a product identifier? Let's say I'm talking about an eight ounce smoked Atlantic salmon that was produced on last Monday. So I have both the type of product and I have some kind of instance identifier, be it a serial number or a lot number. So I want to know some specifications. I'm not a big fan of bones in my smoked salmon, so I might want to make sure that it's pin bones out. I want to know its history, i.e. what we call traceability. So I want a list of all the critical tracking events. I also want to know where this product has been. What was the journey for the smoked salmon? In addition to this, I want to know information about certain supporting documents. I may want to know that a valid hazard plan existed when the transformation took place. So let's look at from a 30,000 foot level, how such a system would be designed and work. So given that a debt product identifier, I am now going to first reach out to a resolver. So what is a resolver? Well, think about it this way. If you type in www.google.com, there's this magical thing, we call it DNS. It resolves that name into the address of the machine which you're actually going to be talking to. A resolver in our case is simply, 
give me the name of machines that will give me certain information. So let's look at that. So I'm getting this concept of a link type. If you're familiar with linked data, you might say, well, that's kind of the predicate in RDF. Well, it's, and then next, so I'm asking for product info, and here is a URL, a web address. They claim that they can give me product information about this product identifier. I can get, ask for trace information. I can re request location information. So let's assume that we take, we want some product information. I send the return URL here, we send it to a machine, and that machine now returns to me product information. Now that brings up, we need some more info standards. We need to understand the product protocols. We need to know the identifiers. We need to know the message formats. And we need to know the link types. So let's start by looking at the different data groups. First, we have the master data. Now, master data is data that does not change very often. Product specification, or in G10 or GS1 speak, a trade item definition. We have information about the location, the farm, the vessel, process plan, and we have information about the trading party. You also have the traceable subjects, product instances, logical, logistical units. We have business types of data, transactions and purchase orders. We have supporting items such as documents and certifications. And last but not least, we have the history records. We call these critical tracking events. So let's look a little bit at some examples to make it less abstract. Here, showing some supply chain entities or locations. Here, I'm showing a list of product definitions. So if you dive in and look at the product definition, so in this case, this is what the server returned to us. He returned a link to a picture about the product. He sent us some brand information. He also returned some seafood specific, such as the nutritional information or rearing methods. We also got nutritional information, packaging information, and we got some attachments. Next, let's look at a location. The SCE or supply chain entity, which is location, I will explain why we see it at a higher level a little later in the presentation. But the location, it gave us a picture of the location, it gave us a latitude longitude, so a map could be displayed, it gave us certifications, start and end dates, gave us contacts. So this is what came back from the server when we asked for information about a SCE. And there's many, many different ways to display it. Here's one way. Now let's look at critical tracking events. Here we're showing a farm harvest event, and then we have a receive event. So let's look a little deeper at the farm harvest event. So the farm harvest event gives us information about the you know, the five W's, who, what, where, when, and why. It also gives us information, links to documents. Here it is a harvest record. Also at the amount that was harvested. I think some might ask, what is this data owner up here? Well, the data owner is kind of the sixth W about the CT. We introduced this about a year ago and GDST looked at that and, and was decided to agree to include that. And it's about the who entered the data, especially upstream. Very often the farm may not enter the data about the farm harvest. It might be the processor or the, who's received it. So it's important to know who actually is the author of the data. Now let's dig, dig a little deeper and talk about the different identifiers. So here we have, I've listed 11 different reference types. In the first column is the reference type, product specification, trading parties, logistical unit, lot identifiers, critical tracking. In the middle, we have quite a few kind of nicknames or you know, acronyms for that. I am, on the side note, I'm a strong member of AAA, Americans Against Acronyms. But every now and then, they sneak their way into our domains. This column here is the URI. A universal resource identifier. It is not meant for human consumption. It plays a vital role in how we do link data. It's very prescriptive. Now you will notice that some of the rows have multiple entries. That is because we expect that way upstream farms and vessel may not have a GS1 prefix. So this says that we can actually support both, both a GS1 
prefix URI and one without a GS1 pre, uh, prefix. Let's look at the different message types next. So here I, we have identified eight message types, product specifications all the way down to critical tracking events. You will notice that six out of these are standard G, uh, GDSN or GS1 message types. There are two that we have location data, which I'll come back to a little bit later, and the document. So those, we are working now to come to an agreement yeah, about how the best, those two message types, but overall, vast majority is using standard messages that's being used in industry today. Let's look at some example messages. So most messages come with three, we have a message identifier, you have a standard business document, and then you have the message itself. Let's look at the message identifier. Here you see it says dispatch advice. This tells me this is a dispatch advice message, which is, a, is another name for a type of advanced shipment notification. So this moment I've seen this, I know what type of message I got. Next, we will have the standard business document header. Notice we have a message version, we have the sender, we have the receiver, and we have some information about this message itself or the document. The actual message, you will notice here that we have the receiver, we have a shipper, we have a, some dispatch information, we have information about the purchase order, we have one or more dispatch advice logistical units. Within that, we have a number of lines where you can see this is clearly like a packing list. And so that's basically an example of these messages here. I want to dive in and look at how we represent these critical tracking events. We introduced them last week. So here I'm showing a list of 25 different critical tracking events that we have identified. Let me go through a little bit here. The first column is kind of the, the gen, generic name of it. The second is the EPCIS type. The third column is the action. The fourth column is the business step. And the fifth column is the disposition. When data is exchanged in the EPCIS message, it will be the four, the, the EPCIS type, the action, the business step, and the disposition will be key to defining what type of event this is. We have found it very natural to give each of those combination a name. And those are the 25 uh, names that are, we have identified. Now, regardless of how we do this, it's important to understand a little bit about the language or the ontology that comes together here. We have, we are using attachment types, certification types, color methods, fishing methods, harvest method, killing methods, product condition, rearing methods, species, and unit of measurement. Since all full chain traceability system must support material balance, it's very important that we all agree on how to spell pounds. If you ever looked at how people abbreviate pounds, there are numerous different ways to do that. Now, what's interesting here is that we have identified about 87 different attachment types, 117 different fishing methods, 45 different rearing methods. You know, we have in the seafood industry almost 13,000 species. And we have a list here that we are basically making public and we are working with existing lists and trying to harmonize all of these lists so that we all can agree to what if two different full chain traceability system and exchange fishing methods, it's very clear what it means. Now, let's look at the protocols. How do we send and receive messages? The first here on the left is a standard business message. And this is the advanced shipment notification or dis dispatch advice. Here we are recommending that we continue using and support the AS2 message, and the, which was introduced by Walmart in the early 2000. It is basically EDI over HTTP. This protocol is currently widely accepted and widely used throughout the industry. Now, when it comes to traceability data, you're saying here that this is more based on open application programming interface or an open API. It's REST-based and is also got used over HTTP. It's widely used throughout the industry today. So let's look a little bit more into this concept of links. So let's start with the location. So if you look at a supply a location or what we call a supply chain entity, there are basically five different types of links. You have the owner of it, 
You have who entered the data. You have the SEC itself, information about the farm. You have all the attachment associated with that farm, like we saw the pictures, et cetera. And you have certificates. All of these are then linked to this. Next, let's look at a critical tracking event. It has seven types of links. We have the you know, owner, the data owner, the location, again, points to an SEE. We have the product instances, both the consumed, observed, or out produced products. You have the event data itself. We have, again, attachment and certificates that are all linked to this critical tracking event. So what we're starting to emerge from this is a web, a graph. And so it, the links or the, the lines that connect the different circles is what we call link types. So there are several types. If you look first, and this list is growing and expanding as we continue to path. First, let's look at a specific type of product identified by global trade item number or a GTA. We might want to know the brand owner, the product definition, recipes, that's good, allergens, treatments, additive, is this kosher? And we might want to also know consumer feedback. If you're looking at a specific product, remember we talked about last time that's identified by an electronic product code, there I might want to know the traceability, sustainability, labor, country of origin labeling, freshness, and consumer feedback, i.e. maybe the full product story. This brings us to who should have access to this data. Is it, you know, we, we don't want a open traceability system that gets filled up with spam. We look at this to determine access, we split it into two parts. First is the authentication, and the second is authorization. The classic way to do authentication is an email address and a password. If it's correct, we say this is the user. That's not very practical in a distributed, open, full chain traceability environment. Instead, what we are using there is trip, uh, cryptography. So let's say Bob and Alice. Bob wants to send some traceability data to Alice. Bob takes, creates the full chain traceability data. He encrypts it using his private key. That data then encrypted travels across the internet and comes to Alice. Alice says, okay, do I know Bob? And if she does, she looks up his public key, decrypts the data. If that is successful, she can be very, very certain that the data actually came from Bob. And Alice can now say, okay, does Bob, is Bob authorized to send me that data? Now, this brings us to the next topic, which is we talked about blockchain. Now, keep in mind, we do not see blockchain as a data sharing or data integration solution. We believe that if you can substitute the word blockchain for database, that's not the, the, the best use of that technology. We see the role of blockchain and full chain traceability as a trust provider. Instead of trusting that every full chain traceability system operates, quote unquote, correctly, i.e., the system does not allow the receiver to modify received data, the user you know, can then, instead of do, trusting every system, they can trust the net. So we currently have a blockchain, it's an Ethereum blockchain operating on Microsoft Azure. What we now are seeking is to work with other companies, other groups to develop a set of smart contracts so that if we implement the smart contracts on any acceptable blockchain technology, so this will enable us to have full interoperability between blockchains. As long as the smart contract is in, in implemented and it can be used, you can actually have interoperability between the different blockchains. So in summary, we talked about the seven pillars of FCT, how they came together and gave us that. Our goal is, of course, that this is open. We get the traceability internet. And this will allow any provider to be able to create a solution based on the standards we have discussed and and become a full member of the traceability internet without having to pay, quote unquote, a third party to participate. So in summary, what we are seeing is a new technology have enabled a new methodology for full chain traceability. It's all about the data because that's where the value is. We have identified the seven pillars of full chain traceability. We have talked extensively about the different data links and make sharing FCT data easy. 
just share the ASN or the packing list. It seamlessly handles the management of document and cert certificates. GDSC and GS1 provide standard that enables a fully interoperable FCT solution. The FCT methodology makes full chain traceability a practical reality. And the goal is to enable the traceability internet. So let me leave you with some references here on the screen. 